It is spring 2018, which means there's new anime, a whole bunch of new anime, which I'm going to review. I've seen the first episode of all of these shows, and I'm going to talk about what I saw and what I thought. A few quick notes. Um, I do not review any straight sequels or straight follow-ons from previous shows. So a straight-up season two, I'm not reviewing here because... You're probably not going to jump onto Season 2 before watching Season 1, and that will tell you if you want to watch Season 2. Um, also, I skipped anything that, that clearly looked aimed at, like, kindergartners. You know, shows that are just very much rounded character designs, walking around gardens, you know, and, and things like that. Um, those sort of things I skipped as well. Everything else, I, I think I watched, I covered everything on Crunchyroll and High Dive, and I think that's pretty much everything else, uh, everything available. May have missed one or two things, but this is like 34 anime. So I think this will give you a pretty good idea of the season. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, 3D Kanojo Real Girl. And this is actually an anime series that um, I had a bit of a problem with because um, the main character is an otaku who ends up getting a girlfriend. And um, so it's sort of a romantic comedy series, but the main character is this very reserved kind of a jerk otaku and I couldn't it wasn't quite clear from the show this show seemed to be about how initially being an otaku is okay but then as soon as he meets that girl he gives up being an otaku like he says that so that he can date her and it just seems like a weird mixed message for an anime series clearly aimed at otaku so maybe that message gets gets modified over time, I don't know, but it just, it felt like it was kind of setting up otaku as being ridiculous and silly and um, kind of pathetic, um, which is just kind of a, a difficult thing to, to appreciate as somebody who likes this stuff. Um, <laughs> that said, there is, um, it's effectively paced and directed, so um, it's certainly very clear what's going on. It's slow paced, typical romance anime series, uh, very much set in the modern real world. Um, it does feel like it's a bit of a kind of a rip off of like a Densha Otoko or Please Teacher um, kind of a series, but certainly not poorly done. Just I think some mixed messages there, who knows. But that is available on High Dive if you're interested in that. Certainly not a low quality thing. And there's Alice or Alice, which I was certain was an adaptation of like a hentai visual novel. Um, it's about a, a boy who lives with a bunch of girls who call him Onichan all the time. It's you know very much kind of what you'd expect out of that kind of a concept. Uh, I believe it's a it's an ONA or at least um, very short episodes. I think five minute long episodes. Uh, very fan service heavy. Cute. Um, some I watched I think episodes one and two and there's some real fan service in there. Um, some sort of brocon stuff going on there as well. It feels like a very light, fun, silly thing if you want to watch cute girls calling you an Ichan all the time. And I'm not judging. It's one of those things where you know there, there doesn't seem to be much more depth than that. But it is very much that kind of you know cutesy girls who are falling all over you. Then there are cases where they literally like you see things from the main character's perspective. So they are looking at the viewer and saying Oni Chan Daisuke. So yeah, one of those kinds of shows. Um, all right, moving on, Butler's X Battlers. This, if I recall correctly, uh, Crunchyroll, um, uh, rather Otome kind of a concept, so definitely a lot of hot guys. A um, lot of characters in this, a lot of things going on. Interesting concept, I'm not gonna spoil it for you. Uh, focuses on a hot guy main character, and there's some um, intrigue and mystery going on in his world. Uh, living in this kind of um, uh, definite sort of modern day, as I recall, environment, but really cool, um, uh, uh, cool, interesting setup for the premise and where the characters are going. Um, so hard to tell where that's going, but it, it seemed like a good, a good establishing first episode. Um, it, it, I think it's one of those things where they bit off a lot in this show in terms of juggling a large cast of characters. There's a fantasy sci-fi element as well. Um, so there's just, it's, it's a lot to do. Um, animation is, 
I would say above average, maybe 7 out of 10 for the animation. You know, good, not amazing, but they may be saving that for later episodes. Um, so no complaints. Um, we will see where that goes, though. Moving on to Caligula, which is a show that I was quite interested in for, for this season to see where what that was going to be, because I saw what the concept was, which is basically, I love this idea. Um, there's this sort of Hatsune Miku-style virtual idol. And she achieves consciousness. Whereupon she starts paying attention to all of these song lyrics that are being submitted to her all the time. And they're all being submitted by angsty 14-year-olds who are constantly writing about how awful the real world is and how much it sucks to be alive. So she becomes convinced that the real world is this horrible hell in which humans are trapped and so has um, sucked real people into her world. Um, you don't see much of that in the first episode, I should, I should point out. Um, but I really like, love that idea of kind of a twisted virtual idol who is saving humanity from itself based on this misunderstanding of what song lyrics actually are. But the, the tone and vibe of the show is much more serious. It's definitely aimed like a teen audience where there's action, there's that sort of high school drama stuff. Yeah, very weird title, but there's I, I'm pretty sure that there's a, a reason for that. Um, and basically, it appears to be about the, the main characters in this world trying to break out of it. So if, if you've seen Angel Beats, very much that concept in general. Um, the action has a pretty high animation budget behind it, and there's a lot of like philosophy into it. The main character is very interested in, in these questions of philosophy and what it means to be... A human, and it brings up um, quotes from like Greek philosophers and things along those lines, and personality profiles. So the the staff have clearly done their research into that what it would what it would mean psychologically to be trapped in these environments, um, and so the psychological aspects seem seem to be there. The first episode is very much establishing and setting up the characters and and some of the situation without really explaining much of what's going on. So be aware that it is, um, you know, it is sort of an episode zero instead of an episode one. I was fairly impressed. Um, this is the kind of concept that could be done, I think, uh, very poorly. It could be done in a very obvious way, but they didn't do that. It is definitely something where, um, you know, they're, they're, they're focusing on stuff. There also seems to be a, a few little references to other anime, stuff like there's a, a girl that reminds me a lot of, of Lane. Um, there's a Whisper of the Heart kind of visual image reference, uh, things along those lines. Um, what's also interesting is it's kind of acknowledging um, um, a Yelp society and internet and, and reviewing things and so forth in a way that anime generally doesn't. Um, and uh, some, some interesting weird visual elements in there as well. So if you like those more psychological, thoughtful shows, Caligula seems to be heading in that direction, might just turn into you know a lot of weird action and kind of random... Um, uh, random philosophical statements, but who knows? Uh, certainly, certainly better than it could be. Uh, Comic Girls is one of the shows I just really, really enjoyed this this season. It is about uh, a group of high school girls who all uh, live in the, in the same all girls dorm and make manga. On the one hand, it is very much a a bunch of cute moe girls who are all striving for their dream and being very cute while doing so. Um, high animation budget, the girls are very much engineered to make you go, aww, the entire time. And I fell for it. I totally, totally loved this stuff. Um, art is beautiful. I wrote it down on here, dang the animation. And uh, just a lot of stuff. Very much in that sort of Kyoto animation vibe of art style. A um, couple other uh, uh, fun little jokes. I was definitely laughing at some of the, the comedy in here. And uh, so I, I really like that. And there's even, like at the very end, there's a tag, something that happens earlier on, and it shows that a character has changed a little bit over the course of the episode. So good on them there. Um, also should point out, it's set in Fukushima. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm intrigued. I really like this one. I would say it's more of the relaxing show of the season, kind of the just, you know, enjoy yourself season. Although Crossing Time might also be that one. It is a an anime of short episodes about characters uh, who are pausing for a train to go by and just a little conversation they have during that period. Just little little moments 
while waiting for a train. Uh, definitely a comedy, uh, although that first episode contains a little bit of, I would say, sort of comedic drama. Um, nothing, you know, nothing massive, but it's cute. It's these, you know, these little moments with characters, you know, uh, uh, interacting with, with things and, and uh, kind of dealing with people back and forth. So that is kind of, that, that was definitely fun. Uh, and if you're looking for something along those lines, um, where it's just kind of fun little comedic moments between characters, and I believe it's different characters every episode, um, I think you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy Crossing Time for that kind of a thing. Um, also a fun little commentary on gender, in, gender insensitivity in that first episode, which I kind of uh, found funny. Speaking of gender, Cutie Honey Universe over on High Dive. Uh, this is a... It, it actually appears to be a, a sequel to the original Cutie Honey. I thought it was going to be a remake, um, but it's, that's unclear. I, maybe it's kind of a, it's kind of a reimagining... Um, Cutie Honey is remarkable for the fact that it had uh, a lot of nudity and a lot of violence in the original. And that is here in spades, if not amped up in this first episode. So Cutie Honey is this crusader for ju justice and she transforms. There is none of the world building. Um, they don't establish anything about the, the character. She does all the transformation sequences and all that stuff is already there. Um, but this creates a completely different motivation for the, the antagonist, which really surprised me in terms of where the protagonist is going. Like I, 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 you know, leaned forward and was like, huh, why did she say that? And was kind of scratching my head at, at, at the end in a good way, in terms of that's a, that is a, I don't know where she can go with that. Why would she be doing that? I'm, I'm intrigued to learn more. So good on them for there. Again, a lot of nudity, some Yuri stuff, um, some, some strong violence and not just violence, but like, you feel bad when this one character dies. You know, they, they actually make that f feel significant. So good on them there. Um, it also feels kind of like a 70s anime in, in a lot of senses, in the sense that definitely the art is upgraded, the animation is upgraded, um, but it has that kind of goofiness, that kind of over-the-topness of a lot of 70s, uh, an, uh, 70s anime concepts. It, it keeps a lot of that stuff. Also, a lot of the character designs are upgraded, but essentially the same. So you have Panther Woman is one of the, the, the bad guys. Okay. Um, so if you're at all familiar with Cutie Honey, this is definitely Cutie Honey. It, it is all that stuff. Moving on to Dances, Dances with Dragons. This is honestly one of the more middle-of-the-road series this season, if you will. Um, where the... Um, for example, the opening credit sequence has a lot of choppy animation, and a lot of it is reused from the first episode. So it's like, eh, that's not a great sign. Uh, a lot of exposition, a lot of politics. It is this weird combination of modern and fantasy where it's set in a world where magic has been reintroduced to the world um, and has spawned dragons and things, but it's people in you know trench coats fighting dragons. So a neat concept there. Um, unfortunately, it's... It feels a little bit like a kitchen kitchen sink world where there are you know elves and people uh, uh, you know next to each other, but it doesn't really um, it doesn't feel like a cohesive world from episode one, and that's a very hard thing to judge from episode one. So I'm I'm not trying to say they did a bad job. I'm just saying that they throw a lot at you. It feels a lot like something that was made for fans of the existing material. They don't really pull you into and and situate you in this universe very well. There's some exposition at the beginning kind of explaining all of it. Um, but it, again, it feels like it's more for existing fans than, than others. But I can uh, certainly see some people, you know, um, getting getting into this. It's, it's a fun sort of shonen action sort of a concept. A little, you know, aimed at a slightly older audience, I, I would say. Still sort of older teens. Um, the... Um, yeah. It feels like it's really trying to be quirky and different, and it remains to be seen whether that that creates a cohesive story or setting as it goes on. A lot of these concepts can kind of fall apart for that at some point. Uh, moving on to Devil's Line, I am not going to tell you much of anything about Devil's Line, um, <clears throat> because there is a big twist um, later on in episode one, um, and I'm not going to tell you anything about you know what kind of twist that is, wh whatever. Um, but they're clearly trying to hold that off. Um, I was impressed that the characters go to college. They are actually college students. We don't see college a lot in anime. There is... 
the episode sets up some odd juxtapositions in terms of different characters, like a character trying to fight something that is obviously too powerful for that person, um, or trying to do something that, that seems out of character, and I think that is very intentional. Uh, this is about characters put in very awkward, or not just awkward, but very difficult situations and seeing how they respond and what they do as a result of that. Um, I had some strange feelings about some of the... There's there's a romance in it, a quasi-romance in it, hint of romance kind of a thing, and some of the things the characters said about each other just felt a little weird and wrong, but again, it may be one of those things where they don't, you know, they just haven't explained all that uh, later on. So definitely episode one kind of a thing. Um, animation is mediocre, not terrible, not great. Um, some stiff movement in the animations, and again, sometimes that works its way out as the show goes on. There's a, definitely a Twilight vibe to it a little bit in terms of some of these romantic relationships. So who knows where that go, that's going. Can't tell, but an interesting concept um, and uh, a nice twist in it. Moving on to Doreku over on High Dive. This is, this feels like a hentai anime where they just said, let's go legit by deleting all the actual hentai scenes and just release that. Um, it is about a this device that goes into your teeth, um, not permanently, but you sort of set it next to your teeth, and you, you do that, and somebody else does it with a paired device, and then you make a bet with the other person. And if you lose the bet, this device sends a message to your brain that makes you completely subservient to the other person. You basically become their slave, and that's the concept. And there's a strong sexual element to all of it. Um, it's pitched as more of a psychological story, sort of a, a horror thing about why would people do this to themselves and somebody, you know, people do this to get back at people. I should point out there is, um, as a result, there is a lot of stuff around um, non consensual sexual experiences, right? That is inevitably going to be interwoven with this kind of a concept, and they lean very heavily on that, as you can see in the art, <laughs> right? That's, uh-huh. Um, very kinky, as uh, Tonto says in the chat room. So just be aware of that. Um, from what I've seen, they are doing a good job of delving into the psychology of that and why someone would do that and things along those lines. Um, um, and I don't want to spoil too much about that. There are a few... Things which I wasn't impressed with, there, there are times when, when, the, when the, the protagonist is walking along and is monologuing their personality at you. I do this, and I do that, and I don't really like this uh, over there. And it's like, you should be showing that to us in the show instead of telling it to us in, in monologue, but whatever. Um, some weird musical choices, um, things along those lines. But um, overall, I, I, I thought it was an interesting show. Um, definitely an interesting concept. And... Um, I'm probably not going to watch any more of it because I think it's, it's, it's just, it feels a bit too um, exploitative of its concept. But it's the kind of show where if you watch this, I would understand why someone would watch this, why someone, someone would be interested in this. I think they're, they're handling that concept with, I mean, certainly a lot of unnecessary kink, but also with a respect for the subject matter, if you will, over there on High Dive. They seem to be getting a lot of the sexy stuff this, this season. Um, moving on to, yeah, I wouldn't really call this sexy, Fist of the Blue Sky. This is a spin-off of Fist of the North Star, actually a prequel to Fist of the North Star, technically, about the, uh, I don't know, um, one of the, the, um, people who have this fighting style that Ken has, and this is also Ken, set in 1920s or 1930s Hong Kong amongst gangsters, triads. So love that whole thing, uh, uh, that whole tone, you know, gangsters, machine guns, um, but also, you know, Chinese clothes and, and that, that interesting combination of modern with uh, you know, traditional Chinese clothing, stuff like that. And it's entirely CGI. And that's the big problem with this, is that the problem with the CGI, the CGI um, character designs do an Im amazing job of copying the art style. You know, it looks like the art style, I have no problem with that. 
But apparently, in order to actually produce 24 minutes of it, they had to lower the frame rate dramatically. So, these characters have a pretty low frame rate for the entire thing. And that's the problem in an action series. It just really feels cheap a lot of the time. Uh, this also isn't helped by the fact that they also copy the overall sort of tone of Fits of the North Star, where there's some goofy moments. There are characters who get, you know, killed off early on in somewhat humorous ways, where, you know, they're, you have the, the classic thing of you know, the, the, the very puffed up villain who gets, you know, wiped off the, the face of the earth in, you know, minute 10 of the episode. And um, those things are handled much more lightly and, and sort of upbeat. And that tone feels really weird with these CGI characters. Plus the art style, all the guys are giant beefcake, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger muscle men, which sometimes does not translate very well into CGI either. Uh, they just look weirdly proportioned based on what we're look, looking for. So I'm not against CGI, but I think this is a case where the CGI was not a great match for the studio and the concept. That said, it's another example where if somebody got into this and watched this, I would totally understand it. Uh, it is an exciting action concept, and they, they do a good job of setting up the relationships between characters, um, where <sighs> Fist of the North Star tends to be a very over-the-top concept, but the fact that it actually um, it establishes who is who and who is on what side and why they care about each other in that, epi that first episode, quite impressed. That's the, good on them there. We'll see where that goes and if anyone you know is going to be angry or not. I am certainly not angry about Full Metal Panic Invisible Victory. Um, I'm reviewing this because I love Full Metal Panic. I know it's a, it's a sequel. Um, but if, you know, if you're at all into Full Metal Panic, yes. 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 This is the thing. This is what you've been waiting for. Okay, moving on. Um... A remake, actually, Gegege no Kitaro. This show has a really interesting problem. Namely, the original anime came out in, I believe, the very early 70s, or the late, I think 68, late 60s. And as you can imagine, the art style was kind of crude, um, based on a very popular manga. So this franchise has been around for years and years and years. There was a, a remake in the 80s, I think. Um, so this is one of those franchises that's been around for decades and decades, but really isn't modern and relevant to the average, you know, Joe off the street, right? Um, the average kid has heard of Kitaro, but isn't really familiar with it. So this series has to reintroduce them to Kitaro, who is this young boy who can see spirits and yokai, you know, Japanese monsters, kind of, and he banishes the ones that are misbehaving, defeats them. So, on the one hand, it is kind of this shonen action concept. On the other hand, it's basically horror. And some horrible things happen to Kitaro, especially in the manga. And this show does all of that. I own, gosh... Six or seven volumes of Kitaro manga in English. Pretty much everything has been, been released so far, officially, in America. I love this, this character, this franchise. And they make this a, an action-y shonen series with some outright scary horror moments. Like, thumbs up on that. Um, full art style, full color art style. It doesn't look dated, although it looks very weird, and that's very much, you know, the way it should be. And I, I was, I'm just really, really impressed. One of those things where I'm like, yes, this, this ticks all the boxes, but at least for a Kitaro fan. Um, and so if you want something kind of weird and creepy, and, um, but also you know, more modern and action-y, um, and it is more that shonen style, Kitaro, great job on that. We'll see if they can continue it for future episodes. Moving on to Golden Kamui, another anime that I actually happen to have the, the manga for, at least the first couple, couple of volumes. Uh, based on a, a manga with the concept of a... Well, no, that is explained in the first episode. I don't want to spoil that. Um, this is another difficult thing to adapt, in a sense, because the main characters are a, like a, a man in his, I think, late 20s, early 30s, 
and this young teen girl, um, both of whom are stoic badasses. And it's very easy for that to feel very um, dull, you know, where they don't have much to talk to each other about, uh, and they're just kind of stoic all the time. They did a great job here of making both of these characters appealing to the audience without reducing their bad acidness. Uh, it is set in, I believe, the 20s or 30s in the very north of Japan, Hokkaido. And it is very much dealing with the, the times of that period, some of the stuff that was going on kind of historically, although the actual story is fictional, as well as some of the culture in Hokkaido. So you get some interesting elements about that. I'm not, f I'm not aware of exactly how accurate it is to things about like the Ainu, which are the native peoples of Hokkaido, are a major factor in this show. I'm, I do not know how, again, how accurate that is and how, how much every single detail matches historical Ainu. Uh, but there seems to be a lot of, of detail about that, a lot of research into it. So if you're interested in that, you will get some, some elements of it in Golden Kamui. It's, fundamentally, though, it is a, um, an action series aimed at an older audience. So it is more in the genre, it's definitely more of a seinen story, I would say, more in sort of a cowboy bebop or trigun genre sort of block than other things, uh, um, the other shows around there. Uh, but still, you know, good fun action stuff, some comedy elements along those lines. So neat stuff there, um, and we'll have to see. And I, I just like the fact that it is aimed at that older audience. Um, another sequel, which I'm just going to talk about because I love Gundam, Gundam Build Divers. This is the third Gundam Build series. I'm not going to talk too much about it, just to say that it is a more comedic, more light and upbeat series than the previous ones. Uh, the first one was more of a Gundam parody while telling its own story. The second season was a shonen um, premise and structure f as, a, as a Gundam series, so more of like a One Piece or a Naruto in the Gundam universe. Gundam Build Divers is a bit more of a, um, a light action adventure story within the Gundam uh, universe. I enjoyed it, FYI. Moving along. And also, you definitely do not have to see, have seen any Gundam to appreciate Gundam Build Divers. Moving on to another surprise this season, Grazeni Money Pitch. This is a baseball anime all about the economics and the career of being in baseball. Meaning, the main character is this, I think, 29-year-old, 26-year-old relief pitcher, and he spends the entire episode talking about the salary he makes and how much salary he needs to make next year and all the different career decisions he has to make to stay in the game and to be able to fulfill his career and have enough money by the time he, he finishes to actually be able to live off that for the rest of his life, right? You know, he's not a superstar making millions of dollars a year. He's making a comfortable living, but he better not drop off because then he's not going to have enough built up to retire off of. So that's a really, really interesting concept. Um, and it is told in a fun, light way. So the tone is definitely more of an... Um, a modern comedy where it's a, a light upbeat story in general um, think of more of a maybe a K on in concept or maybe even a lucky star so it's a fun uh, look at that concept but very much more from the perspective of managing your career and what that is like so obviously aimed at an older audience there's a lot of baseball in there obviously so if you like baseball um, it's not just constantly about money you get a lot of fun moments with uh, the baseball games and and how he handles all that and all that kind of stuff. So, again, if you like baseball, this will probably be up, up your line. Um, and it's an interesting twist on the whole concept. Quite a high budget in terms of animation, too. Uh, nice voice acting and just an interesting perspective on the whole hobby. And it's a half-hour TV series. I mean, it's a full TV series. That's kind of cool. Uh, all right, moving on to Hinamatsuri. This is one of the series that seems to have gotten a lot of attention this season. Um, and it got some attention from me because I was intrigued by the beginning of the show. It has this very goofy concept where this uh, little girl 
shows up in this guy's apartment and proceeds to kind of trash everything in his, in his apartment until he gives her food and clothing and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, what it turns out to be is the main character is a member of the Yakuza. And it's funny because last week we were talking about where are all the Yakuza anime. Main character is in the, in the Yakuza. And this little girl turns out to be, you know, the anime trope of the little girl with massive powers in another dimension who can, you know, destroy a building with a, a by pointing at it and a giant beam, you know, um, leaps out of her finger and blows up a building. She's those ridiculous powers. But she spends all of her time being a weapon. And in this world, he treats her, I mean, he doesn't know how to treat her like a, a daughter or anything. But he treats her like a human being. And she starts responding to that. So on the one hand, it's a very traditional anime kind of comedy. Where it's two people in this wacky situation. They don't quite understand each other. And they're messing around with each other back and forth. And I really enjoyed that whole concept. Um, um, I think it, it is... It is well structured in terms of how it presents its characters and its information of revealing things in a very natural way. Uh, it's very easy for these shows to kind of throw things at you or be very obvious um, or to try to be way too subtle. And this gets a nice little middle ground there. Um, so good job on Hina Matsuri. Definitely more in a traditional anime style in terms of it's, you know, cute characters, some action, some comedy, that kind of stuff. If you're looking for something more, you know, it doesn't go too weird out of the traditional anime, um, anime world, uh, anime art style. Moving on to Isekai Isekaya. This is a weird one. It looks like normal anime. The <laughs> so this is about a traditional Japanese um, bar, basically, that fronts onto a Dungeons and Dragons style fantasy world. So it starts with two local guards walking along the street. And one of them says, hey, there's this great new bar in town. We should go in. And they go in, and the other guy hasn't been in there before, and he's introduced to this, you know, amazing Japanese bar where they have beer that tastes good and, you know, food that tastes good and all that stuff. And on the one hand, it is it is kind of playing around with, with the fact that you know, modern food is so much better than what they had in the Middle Ages just because we have access to, you know, clean drinking water all the time. And they actually make a point about the fact that, oh my gosh, they have glasses. Like, they can afford glass drinking implements. On the other hand, it appears to be very much a show about Japanese bar culture and restaurants. Like, it seems to be like a, basically an advertisement for that. And in fact, um, yes, this appears to be funded partly by a Japanese tourism board. And... Um, or some tourism initiative uh, around the Olympics and the Olympics beyond 2020. So I think it's kind of making people crave Japanese hospitality, basically. But it's got a, a nice animation budget, um, some fun comedy, some fun elements around what it is like eating at a Japanese restaurant, and kind of the, the culture and what, how, how to be polite there. So fun. Short episodes, I think 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And you can kind of get in and out and enjoy yourself. So kind of nicely done. Also cooking theme, or I guess um, hospitality theme, Kakuryo, which definitely feels like based on a Tome game, bunch of hot guys, you know, girls surrounded by a bunch of hot guys. Think Fruits Basket as a classic example. Um, quite an old example now. But uh, girl basically ends up in this hot springs hotel type environment for like monster hot men, right? Basically, it's spirited away, but with a teenage girl protagonist. I guess, although I guess she's like 20 or so. So, on the one hand, like, that's an interesting concept. On the other hand, the, the attitudes around her being there and what she's expected to do are, feel, let's just say, very traditional. You know, she's kind of forced into things and expected to do things just because something happened. Um, and it just feels like a very forced um, premise for the concept. And there's some backstory stuff from like, okay, this is obviously X. They're just not going to explain that now because they want that to be a big reveal at the end. Um, so unfortunately, it's one of those shows where 
probably in later episodes it gets more interesting. It's just this first episode kind of has to be the expositional setup for the premise, and that just doesn't come off very well in this episode. So, FYI, animations okay, um, voice acting, art, all that are certainly okay. Nothing really crazy to write home about. Although the environment of this Ian is is very lovingly rendered. So good job there. Moving on to last period. Not quite sure where, where this what the, this was while I was watching it. It's based on an, an MMO. I believe it's based on an existing MMO in Japan. And the main characters are all characters in this MMO world who go out on quests and accomplish things. So the idea is that this MMO world is real and exists. And the characters who go out on quests and do all that kind of stuff are doing that. Um within the world's context and within this the, the concept of, of or the context of this story they are you know ex, uh, experiencing and exploring these these things um don't know what the title means but it's very cute it is adorable and it is clearly meant to be just adorableness for 24 minutes um i have no familiarity with this mmo they set it up like i think what's happening here is Basically, what happens at the end of the storyline of the MMO or one of the MMO games or something. Um, so they reference stuff that's happened in the past that you're supposed to know about. But clearly, I don't know what's going on. And it feels like a season two. But I am not. I don't know that there was a season one of this. Uh, but definitely cute. Again, fun, light, very comedic. There's a little bit of action, but it, it appears like it's... it's it's very much tangential to the comedic fun stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a cool thing. Um, definitely a, a relaxing show. You can just kind of sit back and enjoy. Not so much Legend of the Galactic Heroes, which is a remake of a, a, an incredibly long OVA. I've seen the first episode of the original OVA, and I think this episode actually does a, a better job of structuring the introduction of this setting in this world. It is a far future science fiction war story. So think Gundam, but without giant robots, basically. I'm sure a giant robot shows up at some point in this, but it's, it's basically spaceships fighting in, in giant fleets. What's great is that the, the original OVA introduces sort of the, the, the antagonist and protagonist in the sense that there are kind of two main characters, one on each side of this conflict. Um, protagonist and antagonist is a little, little off. Uh, but the... Um, in, in the original OVA, you get essentially equal times with each one. In this one, they spend the entire episode one on one of these characters and people around him. And I think it was a great way of doing things because you get to really understand him, see where he's coming from, see the, the factions, the politics going on around him. And then, I don't think it's a spoiler to say, that they, they reference and, and hint at that character at the very end of the episode. So we'll clearly get more about him later on. It's definitely political. It's definitely slow-paced in the sense that there's a lot of you know sci-fi ship stuff going on. But in terms of characters interacting, you know, people aren't they aren't punching each other. They aren't you know going crazy with each other, things like that. It is a it is much very much about people standing around and talking. Uh, but what I saw was nicely structured. It was it was it made sense. The characters were felt realistic, and I think that's the most important thing here, where. I understood where characters were coming from, and I believed in that. So good on there, and maybe that will that will work out. Uh, moving on to Libra of Nil Admirari. Uh, let me get my notes on this one because this is another one where I remember it vaguely, but not so much all the details. Um, let's see here. There it is. It is. This is the most otome anime this season. It is, it is hot guys. Um, I believe one of them is shirtless within like 60 seconds. You know, it, coming out of a shower. I mean, it's one of those shows. Um, set in a sort of quasi-Taisho era um, world. And then they delve into the concept of the first episode, which is this very disturbing horror concept. Um... We're talking like people getting burned alive kind of disturbing horror concept. It is dark. And that's what kind of got my attention about this series. Is that it's not just, you know, hot guys. It is, it is interesting. They actually are doing something unusual in this genre and they're going for it. This is a, 
um, it's very much about how characters react to these things happening and and how you can you can do something about that. Um, so I was very impressed with that. Uh, there are moments in here where I was like, dang. Um, and also impressive. So one of my signals for when I'm impressed with an anime series is when I finish an episode and it either feels like five minutes has gone by or like an hour and a half has gone by. And this felt in, in a good way, right? I, you know, it feels like they packed a movie into this first episode. And that's what they did with the first episode of Libra. A lot happens in that first episode, but it doesn't feel unnatural. They could have very easily padded this out. They don't. And it kind of moves on. So impressive there. You know, nice, nice stuff. Uh, there's also some some smart things around. So it's set in uh, the 1920s, I believe, in Japan. Very different time, very different culture. And they they reference some elements of that that let you work out things that would be a little creepy to modern audiences, or a little weird to modern audiences. Um, but they don't like make a big deal out of it. Like you can realize, oh, that's what's going on. But if you don't make the connections, you're not going to realize that. So good on them there. Let's see here. Moving on to love to lie angle. Another weird term. Um, <laughs> I have three notes about this. Lots of animation. High animation show. Cute and fan service. Um, I don't remember much of anything about this show. I think this is the show about a girl who goes to live in a... Um, with a group of girls, and there's a lot... Oh, yeah, right, that's right. She's going to live with a group of girls, and again, sort of an all-girls dorm concept. Uh, but they're all adults, but there's a lot of... Again, there's a lot of fan service, there's a lot of, you know, girls feeling up other girls and things along those lines. Um, I thought it was cute. I thought it was enjoyable. The fan service felt kind of out, of out of place, though. So be aware of that, but nothing wrong with it. See here. Then, ah, Lupin the Third, Part Five, over on Crunchyroll. So Lupin is an anime character. Been around for gosh, since the seventies. Uh, so he's a long-standing anime character. They've they've been doing movies of this, like, like a you know, made for TV movie of this, like almost every year. Uh, they make new TV series every so often, and this is the new Lupin series, and it is co-produced in France. The show itself. So it's actually set in France, which is great because it looks gorgeous. Uh, there's also a relatively high animation budget, partly because of that co-production thing, and there's more money to, to flow. It is also very classic Lupin, as Matt says in the, in the chat room. Um, all the characters are there. They, they feel like the, the right characters. But there's a twist this time. It is a very modern twist, which I'm not going to spoil, around the, the problem that Lupin faces in this show. It appears, you know, spoilers, um, it appears that this is not an episodic Lupin series. I'm going to repeat that. This is not an episodic Lupin series. There is a story over the course of the entire season, it looks like, because they established some things in episode one. Episode two is building off of that. And the, the antagonist Lupin has to deal with is really interesting. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to see what happens there. There's some fun stuff. There is the expected somewhat... You know, they ignore physics occasionally when the action calls for it. Um, there is occasional sexiness. Uh, Lupin is back in his more um, lecherous mode of early Lupin. There are definite references to Castle of Cagliostro, if you've seen that. But you'll also notice this is blue jacket Lupin. So, curious to see where that's going. But, neat stuff. They've done some good stuff to update the characters and uh, build it up from there. Moving on to Magical Girl Ore, which is a Magical Girl parody. The main character is a, I think, 13-year-old, 14-year-old girl, and uh, who is, it's not a spoiler to say, who, she actually begins the episode by dreaming that she is a Magical Girl, and then ends up actually being a Magical Girl, um, or, a, yeah, well, anyway. Um, magical Girl stuff starts happening, I'll put it that way. But it is very much a parody of magical girl stuff to the point where in her dream uh, the villain starts vomiting out these rays which turn everything black and white and the cute little sidekick says oh no this is terrible it's actually better for the colorists because it, it's much less work but oh no it's, it's draining the color from everything 
So really fun, really ridiculous. And yes, that's a dude in the dress. Um, when she transforms, apparently, we haven't actually gotten to the transformation sequence yet in the, in the show. But when she transforms, she turns into a ripped Arnold Schwarzenegger version of her of herself, um, who is very much very much looks like a guy, um, and that is her magical girl, you know, uh, form. So a lot of fun, a lot of ridiculous, um, and uh, just just really what I like is that it is very much playing around with magical girl tropes and magical girl expectations and so forth. So that's that that's I like it when folks when when series go that deep into these concepts. All right, uh, moving right along. Megalobox. This is a, so this is based on the, I believe, gosh, the 30th anniversary of Ashida no Joe, or Tomorrow's Joe, which is a legendary boxing anime and manga from the 70s. 80s, 90s, 40 years, gosh. Anyway, um, and this is a reimagining of Tomorrow's Joe. The characters are completely different, and it has this very much sci-fi twist. So, again, think Cowboy Bebop, very much in here, uh, in terms of the overall tone of the show. It's, it's about people, kind of dregs of society, just trying to get by, underground boxing rings, that kind of a thing. High animation budget, and one of the best 50 years. Jeez. Thank you, The Dark Blacksmith. That's crazy. Um... In the manga started in 68. So on the one hand, it is to an extent about society and people on different sides of society. You know, the has versus the have-nots. But it is also about what the have-nots do with their lives. How, how, you know, how do you break out of that, those cycles if you can? To me, always the sign of a successful sports anime for me is whether... I get excited about that sport from watching the show. Whether I am like, I want to go see this sport live now as a result of watching the show. And Megalobox definitely does that for boxing. I should point out, you can see from the art here, uh, the characters actually wear like the, these mechanical um, accoutrements that kind of clasp onto their bodies um, as these kind of rigs that make them punch more strongly. And... Um, so there's kind of that sci-fi element to it. It's, it's a very interesting concept, and the art style is not your typical anime series. Um, it merges sort of the, the traditional Joe aesthetic with more modern anime concepts. Uh, Samurai Champloo, absolutely, in, in sort of a tone and art style, I think, um, coming in here. So, again, if you're looking for something aimed at, a, I mean... I would say this is still aimed at like a mid-teen audience, much like original Joe. But the aesthetic is definitely aiming more for that more, um, that, that the older side of that audience. And also clearly, I think, aiming at an American audience and a worldwide audience as well. Uh, this feels much more like New York than Tokyo. We on to My Sweet Tyrant. What on earth? Um, goofy Love Story. That is my entire note for My Sweet Tyrant. This falls into this category of anime that seems to be a pretty popular thing now of two characters in a romantic comedy who are clearly supposed to be together, where one loves the other, but one of them is kind of an a-hole to the other all the time. But it's supposed to be okay because it's a comedy and it's supposed to be funny. And I just can't get behind that. There's just something, the, the, the disconnect for, the, for that to me is just too strong. And it just doesn't really work for me. Um, basically, main character here, I believe, he, he, he is so enamored with this girl that he can't say anything nice to her. He has to say nasty things to her. Otherwise, he'll just kind of explode. Um, and it just... Uh, it, 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 I don't know. I, I can't get behind that concept. It, it feels too weird. Um, and to be clear, like she understands that he, that, that he doesn't mean it, in a sense. But it's still just a weird concept. So, oh well, didn't work for me. But I can see some folks, you know, laughing at that. Speaking of a show that didn't work for me, Persona 5, the animation. I have not uh, played Persona 5. I would like to. I've heard excellent, excellent things about Persona 5. But what I saw of this felt very much... It felt, in a weird way, like it was just checking off everything on the list. Like, we have to introduce this, we have to explain this, we have to show this. And I didn't really, I didn't care 
for any of the characters. They didn't really make me feel bad for any of the characters. The even the 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 big show stopping number action sequence from the beginning of the episode felt flat in a weird way, and I can't really tell why. Um, but it just felt like we need an action sequence here, so we're gonna throw it in. The um, again, the characters are just kind of there. I don't understand why I would care about them, and. I don't know. There was just there's a lot of stuff in here that yeah, it just felt dull, very much by the numbers. Um, also, some weak voice acting in the first episode with some of the, the minor characters. Um, I don't know. It may be one of those things that just doesn't translate to animation very well, um, where just the concept fits a video game, but when you try to make that a linear story, it just feels feels wrong. I don't know. But it just. Uh, uh, I want to try. The, I think this is one of those cases where you'd be better off playing the video game than watching the anime series. But who knows? Maybe maybe it'll get, get go somewhere. Um, also, could just be a poor first, first episode. Moving on to Space Battleship Tiramisu, which, as you can tell from the art, um, looks like a giant robot mecha, real robot anime series, except that they are fighting over food. This is a goofy comedy series set in very much a Gundam setting and universe just with all the, you know, serial numbers filed off. So it is, it feels very much like folks who are like, we want to make a Gundam comedy. The concepts, and it's I think seven minute episodes, the concepts uh, uh, for the individual episodes are just very much wacky comedy concepts, very much in the four coma manga, again, Lucky Star, whatever, um, overall tone for the show, goes very over the top at times. There's one episode that's about him trying to, um, uh, he gets into, to, to pilot his, his mecha, but he accidentally put his shirt on inside out and backwards, so it's very awkward for him to move. So he's trying to, you know, take the shirt off while piloting, and then you, you know, defeat some people, and then you can, now I can get this one thing off and do some more piloting, and can I get it over my head? Oh, this other guy's coming, you know, it's that kind of, of humor. I enjoyed it partly because I'm just a sucker for anything Gundam style, um, especially open Gundam style. And I just really thought this was um, a, a loving tribute to Gundam story cliches with that, those sort of weird comedy concepts layered on top of it. So I really enjoyed it, but that could, you, could just be me. All right. Uh, you know, just, just fun stuff. Moving on to Tata Never Falls in Love. I really enjoy this, but I can't remember from the art what it is. Um, and I've got my notes here somewhere. Uh, ah, yes. So, oh yeah. So this is a very traditional, very middle of the road anime series. Kind of one of these moe anime series. Not moe, but if you like the anime art style and you like shows that just look like anime, that is what this show is. It's about... Japanese characters who stumble across uh, a foreigner girl who's kind of wandering around Japan. And it turns out she is, I don't think it's a spoiler to say, that she is a fan of Japan. Like, she's gotten, she, she's kind of like that otaku fangirl or fanboy who just thinks Japan is the, is the greatest place in the world and is just so thrilled to be here. And as a result, she's, she's, you know, doesn't quite understand certain aspects of Japanese culture. She's very polite. Like, she gets along very well. She speaks excellent Japanese. But, you know, it's like, mm, uh, you know, that, that, that show that you love isn't actually watched by everyone all the time. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a cute show, very, very nice, heartwarming show about various characters trying to be nice to each other, you know, trying to be good people. Um, and there's just fun stuff. There's fun little, little jokes that we otaku would understand about people being kind of over obsessed with things uh, without pandering uh, to the characters. Quite a nice animation budget. This is a show about just anime characters standing around talking and wandering around Japan. It feels very much like an advertisement for Japan though. Again, I feel like this might be one of those tourism uh, sponsored shows, not entirely, uh, but it is a, it's a really, you know, it's, it's a beautiful show, very much getting across kind of how, how lovely Japan can be. Um, and uh, it's 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 cool. It's it's one of those shows that, again, if you're into anime, this will feel very comfortable for you and very much into that that style of, of show. Um, really, really fun. Really, really fun. 
So moving on to this is a surprise. Today's menu for the Emmy for, for the Emmya family. So I started watching this show, and it just shows a, a a young man, a young woman, who go out walking in their local neighborhood, and they're going out to buy, um, you know, food for that night's dinner. And I saw the girl, and I was like, "Huh, that looks like Saber." It's weird. And she turns around. Guy turns around, and it's Saber. Um, this is an anime series set in the Fate universe, but as a a light-hearted domestic cooking show. It's about the two main characters um, as a couple going out, getting food, coming back and preparing the meal, preparing dinner, and going through. I mean, they, they, they spend several minutes showing how the meal is prepared and everything that goes into it and in beautiful animated detail showing every ingredient being cooked it's a cooking show in the fate universe okay uh i yeah. um it's really interesting um lovingly detailed again a lot of animation budget i think it's short episodes but I really, I was really impressed with it. I, and I have, I have watched basically none of the Fate series. I just haven't, haven't had time to dive into that whole universe yet. Um, but I, like, I was charmed. I, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll watch more of this. I have no idea who these characters are, except you can't avoid the Fate universe. But it was, yeah, it was, it was charming. Absolutely. So it, it won me over, despite me having basically no exposure to that universe. Um, moving on to Uma Musume Pretty Derby. Boy, this is a Moe series. Uh, this is a weird Moe series because it is about... So you have a lot of these Moe series where there's one weird twist. Like Katana Maidens, where, you know, girls have these katanas with magical powers in them. And they defend Japan from monsters. Whatever. Idol Master. You know, idol shows. Whatever. This is about girls who are basically treated like horses. They are very good at running. And so they compete in derbies. And they have names the way horses have names. And they go through the competitions. And it is all of the trappings of horses, but with teenage girls. And maybe I'm just old, but it just feels kind of objectifying to these characters. I know they don't exist. I know they're not real. But it's just weird. Like, I expected somebody to hand out oats and for them to eat them from their hand. It's, it's just a little bit too... I don't know. I think part of the problem is that they go to the derby, and it look, it's exactly like a Kentucky Derby track, right? It's all those elements. They go into the cages, and those release, and they start running. Um, it's bizarre. I should point out, they're completely clothed the entire time. It's not that kind of a show. Um, there's a little bit of, of weird... Uh, uh, I don't know. I just I, I found that too bizarre to to really allow me to fully enjoy the series. I watched the entire first episode. It was cute. Characters were fun to, to, to watch and and play around with. Oh, and by the way, of course, when they win a race, they then give a concert because they can't not be idols. So I don't know. It again, nice animation, nice character designs. Um, um, you know. All of the quality is there. All the production quality is there. No complaints about any of that stuff. Just the concept is creepy. I don't know. Again, maybe that's just me. Maybe it's it's me being being who I am. Uh, moving on to a show that really surprised me. Uh, Yotsuhiro Biori is an anime series set at a traditional Japanese like cafe, uh, and it's sort of like a, a, a Japanese tea house. Although not as in the tea ceremony, just one of these little little like cafe places where you can order, you know, tea and coffee, and um, they'll have a handful of snacks and maybe a, a few meals you can order. But it's not like a full service restaurant, and it's basically about um, this cafe and the people that they serve. The entire staff are men, so I thought this would be a very sort of fan servicey boys love thing, but. Not, not so far in episode one. It's just they, they're all guys and they all, you know, hang out and talk. But there's no shirtlessness. You know, there's none of those elements 
that feels like they're kind of pushing that side of things. Um, and the the main character doesn't appear to be doesn't it doesn't look like she's you know lusting after any of the guys or anything or like any of them any of them are lusting after her. So I can't quite peg, and I'm not complaining. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying that I can't quite peg what the show is trying to be, what its audience is. I think it's just kind of everybody, because it is this very relaxing show about what it's like to just sit at a restaurant and relax for a little while, and then maybe do a little work, and just enjoy a nice cup of tea, and maybe a little snack, and just recharge for a bit. It's the kind of thing that you don't expect to see out of a lot of anime. It's, it's non-flamboyant. It's very relaxing. And I just, I really like that. I really enjoyed that. Finally, moving on to You Don't Know Gunma Yet. This show is, was paid for, at least partially, by the, the tourism board for Gunma Prefecture, which is kind of out of the way, a little out of the way in Japan. And again, this seems to be one of those things to try to get people to come to Japan around the, the Olympics and so forth. But what they've done is they have gone very heavily in the other direction. Of, so apparently Gunma is not very well known. It's not a big tourist destination in Japan. So they present it as being this bizarrely out of the way place that takes you just forever to get to and the people there are cut off from society and so they go as over the top as possible with people's expectations around Gunma and like they turn into like this this zombie survival horror apocalypse concept in episode one which then kind of gets thrown away but it's very very over the top with this idea of Gunma so it, essentially it's it is clearly Gunma is awesome but we're instead of trying to pitch that to you we're gonna pretend that gunma is terrible uh, <laughs> and then um uh you know ev eventually over the course of the show i'm sure they'll show more of gunma being a uh you know, worthwhile place to be but i really enjoy the chutzpah of their presentation of this show i think it's a really fun concept and they just did a really good job of of surprising me with this anime series uh short episodes budget is is fine voice acting is fine nothing too crazy here but full points for style and for guts on that one so those are all the shows i saw this season somebody mentioned in the chat room the new what was that the new um do 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 do, 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 do where was it um uh the sword Art online alternative ggo series and yeah that, because that's part of the Sword Art series, I figured it's basically a, a sequel. Same thing with Steins Gate Zero, where I started watching that and saw it's basically, it appears to be kind of a an alternate timeline sequel to Steins Gate. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, you probably want to go back and watch original Steins Gate or be interested in that if you want to do Steins Gate Zero. Not sure, but I, I watched that and was like, you know, as of the first few minutes, I was like, I feel like I should watch Steins Gate before watching this series. So who knows? Anyway, that is all the shows that I could fit in this season. I hope you find this useful. And uh, there are lots more videos here to, to consume. hope you will check those out. Thanks for watching. See you next time.